would like to thank the uh, Federation, uh, the moderators, uh, Dr. Chevalier, for the privilege of presenting uh, our results in adolescents using the mini gastric bypass. Um, I hope not to anger uh, the believers in the other types of weight loss surgery. Um, it is uh, very gratifying for me to be back at the IFSO having uh, presented here several years ago, we now see that um, groups are providing the mini gastric bypass really around the world. Uh, we know of surgeons and teams offering the MGB in England, uh, two in France, Germany, Austria, Spain, Italy, Sicily, uh, in Lebanon and Turkey. And next month, I'll be performing a uh, live MGB at the Turkish Society meeting. Um, I'm pleased to have one of my colleagues here from Punjab, India, who came to visit us in the United States, who's reporting on his results with the MGB. And similarly, in Australia, in Perth. In I think Thailand. the topic is adolescent obesity. Can we stop the advertisement? <laughs> Thank you. I really didn't have much to say about uh, 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 adolescent obesity because uh, much has already been said as far as the uh, epidemic. Can we see the results? Uh, yes. Well, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, we have. Uh, you see that generally about 0.7 percent of all weight loss surgery is done in adolescents, and um, <coughs> most other uh, reports of uh, the band or the bypass, with the band being very safe with a moderate failure rate and the RU and Y basically being more effective but somewhat more complicated and difficult to revise. A mini gastric bypass, uh, somewhat short, uh, we like the sleeve gastrectomy because it's kind of half of a mini gastric bypass. Uh, we do like the MGB because of its reversibility and its effectiveness. And so this report describes our experience with 34 patients. The selection criteria are pretty similar. not. At your request, we'll just skip over these. They're pretty similar to most other selection criteria. They're rather strict. We had 35 adolescents between 12 and 18 years of age. 0.7% of my personal series of 4,400 MGBs from between 1998 and 2008. The mean age was 15. The weight was 100 kilograms, BMI 39. So basically, these are adult dimensions in adolescents. The mean operative time, uh, one of our attractions, 39 minutes, the median hospital stay one day, and the weight loss at one year is 38 kilograms, or 73% uh, excess body weight. There are no leaks, DVT, obstruction, or significant reflux gastritis. Um, we now have five-year data on about half of our patients with uh, essentially no revisions and other complications uh, to date. Um, as I said, a rather short presentation, the MGB is relatively simple to perform with an operating time around 38 minutes. It's reversible and revisable. We think it's relatively safe comparable to the lap band and safety and ease of performance, but it tends to be more powerful, uh, similar to the Ruin Y gastric bypass, and maybe even uh, comparable in some cases to the biliopancreatic diversion. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of presenting this, and I apologize for my initial delay. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Thank you for the discussion. Uh, as you're aware, people uh, worry about that procedure because of the reflux of duodenal fluids and bile. Here are children who've got 60 years to go. That anxiety must be a much higher level of anxiety for you for these? Uh, I thought you might ask that, and so I put in a study from Australia looking at the long-term follow-up uh, Bill Roth two patients in Australia who um, had had uh, Bill Roth II for ulcer disease. There are controlled or, or long-term population-based studies from Finland, Australia, the Mayo Clinic, and others looking at this issue, but I'll just uh, talk about one. In this study uh, published by Brasley uh, from Australia, 569 partial gastrectomy patients for peptic ulcers were followed. 
507 or 83 and a half percent had Bill Roth twos. The duration of follow-up mean was 17 years, and the expected rate of gastric cancer in that group of patients based on population analyses was six and a half. <coughs> the actual incidence was 1.4. Um, they concluded the risk of gastric cancer was not increased with partial gastrectomy. I think, um, excuse me, we could look at a couple of other issues. This is an interesting study from uh, Sweden of 18-year follow-up of 63,000 women and they identified over this roughly, you know, two-decade follow-up, 156 cases of gastric cancer. So that means every 20 years, it's going to be a 0.25% risk, or two to three cases of gastric cancer in these older women per thousand patients per two decades. Okay. We have removed the organ, though, largely, so that the field effect is, is weak. And what about the esophagus and data from the esophagus? Well, I think reflux esophagitis is a really good concern and a good question. Um, in our experience, reflux esophagitis is very common, as I'm sure you see in your pre-op patients, but the MGB, like the Roux and Y, is very effective in reversing those reflux symptoms, and endoscopy confirms that. Dr. Hager. Uh, Kelvin Higa, Fresno, California. Uh, I guess when we're talking about adolescents and, and these uh, operations, what I've uh, missed I think during this session is a discussion about nutritional consequences. Do you have any nutritional data on this group of patients? Yes, we're, we're fortunate in these younger patients we haven't seen the complications of bypass, but we see in the mini gastric bypass exactly the same incidence of insufficiencies that are reported in the Roux Y series. So almost 5% of our female patients will present with iron deficiency anemia usually managed by, by adjusting the menstrual cycle and iron supplementation. Uh, we can see long-term risk of osteoporosis and low calcium, and so supplementation with calcium and vitamin D, I think, is critical. So I think that in the trade-off between efficacy and safety, we do see that a bypass is a bypass is a bypass as far as the risks of those malabsorptive complications. And so that is a concern. Uh, in our experience, just as it would be for a ruin wire or biliopancreatic. Uh, yes, I uh, watched Dr. Rutledge work for a few days, visited his clinic for a number of days. I haven't seen happier patients. Uh, I just want to say that we did studies on gastric tube, published a few journals, different studies, but uh, without tampering around the esophagus, around the cardia, uh, periesophageal area, just forming the gastric tube the way uh, Dr. Rutledge is, we found an increase in lower esophageal sphincter pressure and a decrease in reflux. And I'm wondering if uh, you've had the same experience, Dr. Rutledge. Well, Dr. Deal, first of all, thank you for your commentary. And yes, exactly. We think that there are a variety of factors, including the attachment of the bowel to the bottom of the gastric pouch, which tends to reduce the uh, hiatal hernia. We think that the um, gastric tube is a relatively anti-reflux operation. Obviously, the loss of uh, abdominal obesity makes a difference. And so our studies show about two-thirds of our patients preoperatively present with gastroesophageal reflux disease. And on follow-up, resolution of that disease occurs in roughly 80 to 85 percent, depending on when we've done that study. So we think it is an effective technique, and I think we do reproduce your findings. John Morton, Sanford, California. At Lucille Packard and some of the other adolescent uh, weight loss centers around the U.S., we have multidisciplinary plan and team members. Obesity is a chronic disease. Surgery is not going to solve it all. You still have to work with the patient, particularly the family. Are there any sort of multidisciplinary uh, aspects to your adolescent care? Yes, I think it's a wonderful question. We think if you do a relatively ineffective surgery, you need a tremendous support team. The less effective the surgery, the more you need support and exercise and advice and counseling. What we found is remarkably the mini gastric bypass is relatively effective and uh, we found that the need for counseling is limited, it's available and we have a team, but it's really surprising how well these young people as well as our older patients do and they don't seem to take advantage of the uh, support 
as much as you might expect. And again, I think it's simplistic, and we saw Dr. O'Brien present a great commentary on that. Diet and exercise, not very effective, needed a tremendous amount of effort for that part of his study. The more effective, the less complications that you have in your surgery, I think then the less there is the need for a quote, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, the, the question is more to point for certain complications, vitamin deficiencies, mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes they have problems with different uh, substances afterwards. Uh, that, that's more to the point rather than diet exercise. I think that's a great point. And we certainly have seen that um, where we have had some of the young people when they've had a transformation in their body image where they're able to go out and do things, be invited to parties, will uh, be stressed by taking alcohol and things like that. It's been a major problem. And we do have resources. I have to say we have failed in some of our patients to provide all the support that they really needed because we've seen problems where a young attractive, where a young woman goes from overweight and less attractive to very attractive and got into things like, as you point out, drugs and alcohol. So that's a very important point. Thank you. Okay, we have time for two more questions and a quick response to each. Peter Goretsky from New York. Now, biliary reflux seems to be more kind of silent and prolonged uh, problem. Um, whether you do any routine endoscopy at any time interval for all your patients, but particularly for the group you presented, and what's your anti-reflux um, protocol for, do you um, uh, routinely put patients on H2 blockers and PPI carophates, because we know the PK of pepsin is about 4.5, and that's where really pepsinogen kicks in and starts to digest the esophagus along with the biliary acids. Well, uh, short answer to that? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we feel that the, the concerns of bile reflux are the major concerns of surgeons who are skeptical of the MGB, and rightly so. On the other hand, we don't see, maybe because of rose-colored glasses, we don't believe that we see much bile reflux as a primary problem. We feel that we do see, like Rue and Y, a significant instance of peptic marginal ulcers and dyspepsia, which we treat with antacid regimens, just as you would in a non bile reflux type situation with, we think, excellent effectiveness. And I would be happy to give you a more detailed answer, but I've been... I will go to the next thing. <laughs> yes, Final question. Me. This is Dr. Klaal. I'm from Punjab, India. I'm doing MGB, meaning gastric bypass, from the last about two and a half years, uh, done about 200 cases by now. And uh, similarly, we don't see any reflux. We are not seen as yet. It's just about one to two percent cases whom we have to put on antacids and they feel good just medically after that. So I had a question for you, Dr. Atlas. Uh, the size of the tube, like the diameter, how much does it really matter? Because I'm making it with 334 g and how much does really it matter as far as the weight loss is concerned? A terrific question. Short answer, I think it means a tremendous amount. Uh, the other day, Dr. Takini was presenting and said that a, a larger gastric pouch was okay with a mini gastric bypass that he's performing. I strongly disagree. Having done both large and small pouches, a smaller pouch basically gives you better weight loss, and I use a very small bougie. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And uh, just get, 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 uh, one final question. I did ask Paul O'Brien, but he forgot uh, it's getting old. <laughs> the, the, my question is, how do you, it is it possibly, probably not going to be short your answer, but try to summarize, how do you explain uh, some uh, hostility in the world of uh, bariatric surgery for this operation uh, and, uh, and uh, why at the end of the day you don't do the, the who and why, I mean, why don't you do the anastomosis? Because if right. you do the, the jejuno, jejuno also means it's closed. Right. I mean, it's, right. could, could you give me an answer? A great yes. question. One is, why are people so hostile to the MGB? I, I hope it's not me personally. If so, I'd like to apologize. Uh, I think that the loop had a terrible reputation because we forgot what we learned in the early 1900s. You can't place a loop adjacent to the esophagus. When Bill Roth invented the Bill Roth II, he was doing small resections at the base of the stomach, of the antrum. And as we, in the early 1900s, as surgeons, we expanded that. We did resections closer to total gastrectomies, and that is a tragic mistake. We learned that. Caesar Roux invented the Roux and Y because of that. You cannot put a loop adjacent to the esophagus. Now, for the next 100 years, 
We treated ulcer disease with antrectomy and Bill-Roth II, and it was a pretty good surgery. It's not perfect. It does have bile reflux. It does have marginal ulcers. It does have its own problems. But it's a short, simple surgery, and we do it all the time. In the United States, Bill-Roth II is done roughly 16,000 times a year. Heaven forbid if it be done by a bariatric surgeon. But it's done for gastric ulcers and trauma and gastric cancer all the time. Now, Edward Mason, uh, the father of bariatric surgery, many would say, put a loop adjacent to the esophagus. And not surprisingly, they, they did badly. And so I think many of us bariatric surgeons remember Mason's results. They were bad. And they hear Dr. Rutledge say he's using a loop. They assume it's going to be bad as well. But this is a loop like the old Bill Roth tube that we do every day in our general surgery practice. Thank you very much, Dr. Rutledge, and at that point we'll...